There are many ways to unpack a sample. One way of doing that is using the debugger and breakpoints method. But where should we actually set our breakpoints and why? The following video is a lesson of my intermediate to expert analysis course. The analysis course just published. If you like the video, you may want to check out the course link in the video description below. Today's lecture shall make you fit to use the debugger and breakpoints method for unpacking samples. To understand where we need to put our breakpoints, we need to look back at how the unpacking stuff works. This was a topic in the last course. We identified five steps. There was create or find a target location, which is usually by opening a process or creating a process or creating a new section. We prepare the target location, for instance, by adding read, write, execute, writes. Afterwards, we write to the target location. And depending on what type of target data it is, we have different Windows APIs that might be used. Then sometimes we need to do preparation of steps before execution. For instance, setting the or changing the entry point in the target process. And finally, the target has to be executed. For the purpose of unpacking, however, I would like to add or prepend another step for the unpacking step, and that is the decompression or decryption step. And here are the Windows API breakpoints that we may use for unpacking, except for the red ones. So the white ones are breakpoints you can set to dump or obtain the target data, the unpacked data. The red ones are usually not the APIs you would put breakpoints on, but they are a good indicator at which stage of or which step in the unpacking process you are currently. I also want to add that this list is not complete, but it covers the most important ones. Please note that not all of these steps might be present in an API log. There are several reasons for that. Firstly, not all of these steps need the Windows API to work. So if you decompress or decrypt something and you implement your own algorithm, you will not need to call the Windows API to do that. The monitoring tool that you're using may not monitor certain APIs. For instance, it may not monitor anti-write virtual memory. Sometimes steps may not be necessary, like the prepare execution step, or such steps may be merged together with another step because one of the APIs might do several things at once. So for these reasons, not all of these steps might be present, but you should try to find roughly where they happen. Let's take a look at an example. Here's an example. That's a log for create remote thread shellcode injection. Now, usually in such a log, you will see way more API calls. A condensed version would look like this. The first thing you should do is identify each step of the unpacking process it will be easier to first see the code that is actually doing this. And I took this code from ired.team. It's a very good side if you want to look up red team code examples, and this is one of them. So here you can see how it works. First, the code obtains a process handler with open process. Next, the code will allocate a buffer using virtual alloc X and supply the process handle to do that in the remote process. It will also, at the same time, supply page execute read write permissions. With write process memory, the shellcode is copied or written to the remote buffer in the other process. And finally, create remote thread will execute the shellcode that was written to the remote buffer. So usually, as a reverse engineer, you do not have this source code available, of course. But for our first example, it should be helpful to see where happens what. 
Open process is the find target location step, which allocx prepares the location, and write process memory writes the shellcode data to the target location. Finally, create remote thread will execute. So now that we identified those steps, how do we know where to place our breakpoints? Well, firstly, the first breakpoint I would set is at the last step or directly after the last step of the unpacking. This is an end breakpoint. And the reason I would set this is to notify you when you went too far while debugging the sample. You may want to inspect the buffers that you are following to see what they contain. And you can only do this if the sample has not terminated yet. Secondly, you consult our steps listing for the white breakpoints and those are the ones that are interesting for dumping. So after doing that, you may determine that virtual alloc X and write process memory were listed as potential breakpoint APIs for dumping. So let's take a look into their specification. Firstly, this is the specification of virtual alloc X. First, we inspect the arguments and there are five of them. There is an LP address as a second argument. But if you remember the code that uses virtual alloc X here for shellcode injection, this was null. So this cannot contain anything of interest for us. And you also see here that this is an optional value. So since we don't find anything interesting in the arguments, let's take a look at the return value. The return value returns the base address of the allocated region of pages. So this is a memory region we actually want to follow. And that means for virtual alloc X, it's not interesting to place the breakpoint on the first instruction, but on the last instruction where the return happens, where you have a value in RAX or EAX. And when this breakpoint hits, it's not so interesting to dump immediately, but you need to follow this buffer and see when it has been written to, to find a proper point in execution where you can dump it. Let's now take a look at write process memory. Write process memory has an LP buffer. This is an input buffer, you can see here in. And this buffer must contain the data that has to be written to the remote process. If you look at the code that we have seen for this, this contains the shellcode data. So our first breakpoint or first way to dump, unpack this code is to place a breakpoint at return for virtual alloc X and then follow the address that is an RAX or EAX in a dump window. And then we run until our end breakpoint and then we inspect this buffer. The second way would be to place a breakpoint on write process memory. And immediately when this breakpoint hits, we dump the buffer that is in the third argument. Let's take a look at another example. This is create thread pool weight shellcode execution. And this is an own process execution of shellcode. Firstly, I would set the end breakpoint at wait for single object. When we identify the steps, we will see that firstly create event creates a target object. Virtual alloc prepares the target location. RTL move memory writes the data to the target location into the formally allocated buffer. And create thread pool weight as well as set thread pool weight are there to prepare the execution. Create thread pool weight connects the weight object or creates a weight object that is connected to the shellcode. The shellcode is used as a callback function, so it's executed by the weight object once the weight is over. And set thread pool weight links the event to the weight object. Finally, wait for single object causes the code in the callback function to execute. Knowing this, where can we place our breakpoints? Firstly, we can again place it on virtual alloc. Now, just this time we have virtual alloc instead of virtual alloc X, but the principle is the same. We place it on the return and follow the address in the return value. 
Secondly, RTL move memory can be used and we can directly dump the buffer contents which are in the second argument. And thirdly, create thread pool weight has buffer contents in its first argument and we can dump those. Because this thread pool weight call connects the shell code as callback function to the thread pool weight object. Now you may wonder, we have here virtual alloc and previously we had virtual alloc x. Why do we have two times the same function that does the same thing but has a different name? Well, the x in virtual alloc x stands for extended. And this is a function version that takes more arguments, so allows a more fine-grained control over what it does. Internally, virtual alloc will call virtual alloc x with the appropriate arguments. Both functions are in kernel 32 DIO, and virtual alloc x then proceeds to call nt allocate virtual memory in nt DIL. nt DIL is responsible for the transition from user mode to kernel mode, which happens here. Knowing this progression of calls, actually you can also place your breakpoint at anti-allocate virtual memory and you will still get the same hit as if you set it to virtual alloc x or virtual alloc, depending which one was used. So some malware may only use anti-allocate virtual memory to avoid that you see the other two. And in that case, you need to be aware that this exists. However, if you do the unpacking steps as suggested here in this course, you will probably always create some sort of API log. And then if you see that virtual alloc, virtual alloc X are used, you know that these are also directly called. Now it's your turn. Please look at the following API logs. Determine the unpacking steps and then identify functions you should break on for dumping. You will see that all of them have some sort of virtual alloc or virtual alloc X API in them. Please try to find more than just virtual alloc because there's usually always another breakpoint you can set. In general, you will note that virtual alloc is actually a very great breakpoint target for most of the process injection and unpacking methods. So if you were not to collect any API logs, so what you can always try is set a breakpoint on virtual alloc X or NT allocate virtual memory. And there's a high chance that you are able to unpack the sample this way. However, it can also be frustrating if there are a lot of virtual alloc calls, which may happen because virtual alloc is such a common thing that you need to do for any kind of program. So for the following logs, try to determine all points you can use for dumping.